1969, Elizabeth Kubler Ross wrote a groundbreaking book on the subject of death and dying. She noted a pattern of behavior that dying patients exhibited as they themselves approached death from a terminal illness or they suffered the death of a loved one. Her five stages have become famous and often repeated in teaching people on you know, how to cope with serious illness, loss, and death. Her five stages of death and in case you've forgotten, her five stages were, first of all, shock and denial, second stage, anger, third stage, bargaining, fourth stage, depression, and then the fifth stage, acceptance. I think we've heard those many times before in various contexts. Now she taught that people didn't necessarily go from one stage directly to the other, but rather went from one to another in a kind of a cyclical fashion. You know, it wasn't like uh, you know, shock and denial and, and so on, you know, one, two, three, four, five. It was like one, two, three, four, five, one, three, four, one, two, you know, it was like this. Shock, for example, would be followed by anger and then depression and then a measure of acceptance, after which people might revert back to bargaining with God for more time you know, in case of a terminal illness. You know, people tended to zigzag from one emotion to another for very amounts, uh, various amounts of time until hopefully they would remain in the acceptance mode for longer and longer periods of time. Think of a you know, roulette wheel. You ever seen a roulette wheel? Certainly not in person, but in a movie. <laughs> you might have seen a roulette wheel. You know, and the, 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 the person who's manning it throws a little ball there, you know, white or black or whatever, throws a little ball in it and it bounces from one, you know, one socket to another as the wheel goes around and then eventually you know, lands in one stock and just stays there as the wheel goes. Well, you know, grieving is a little bit like that. People tend to bounce from one emotion to another, going back and forth until eventually, hopefully, they land in acceptance and they stay there. Okay? Now this is the primary model upon which much of the study of people's reactions to death and dying are based. Kubler-Ross herself was not a Christian. And in later years, she saw herself as a sort of a medium, able to contact the spirit world. And much of her later writings were not taken very seriously for that reason. Now I mentioned this about her because it confirms in my own mind the fact that she did not use the Bible as a model for her death and dying theories. If she would have done so, she would have discovered a similar model to the one that she observed in people. However, she would have discovered a much more complete and satisfying response to death and dying. And that is the response of a believer to death and dying is much different than what she wrote about in her book. As a human being, a believer's response to his or her own terminal illness or the death of a loved one is the same as any other person's response. You know, as we're human as believers, we feel shock and denial and so on and so forth. We feel all of those emotions. However, because of faith in God, because of our trust in Christ, our response goes beyond the mere five steps that she described in her book. Now, if we had to examine one person in the Bible who experienced both the threat of terminal illness and the death of loved ones simultaneously, it would be Job. I think we're familiar with Job's story. He was a wealthy and well-respected man in his community for his, and he was known for his goodness towards others, his wisdom, his piety. He had a large family of sons and daughters. And we also read in the book of Job that God permitted Satan to test him in order to see if Job would be faithful in trial as he had been in times of abundance. So Satan caused Job to lose his wealth, then his children, all of them were killed at once. 
He caused him to lose his reputation and ultimately his health. It seemed to him that he was terminably, uh, terminally ill. And then he lost the love and the support of his wife as well as his friends. Now after all of these things had happened to Job, we read that he did not respond like ordinary people respond. He did not act like the people that Kubler-Ross described in her book. He responded differently than most folks would in a similar situation. You know, most people in his situation certainly would go into denial and go into shock, not wanting to accept the reality of the terrible things that had just taken place. Imagine you lost not just one child, all your children, all of them killed at once. Imagine, and then you have a terminal illness and then you lose your wealth. I mean, who wouldn't go into shock? Who wouldn't go into denial? Ordinary people would try to put the events out of their minds as soon as the funeral was over. You know, people always say, well, life goes on. And those of you who have lost loved ones, you know, somebody said that to you, right? Well, life goes on. You know, I'm, I'm always amazed at how quickly people begin to talk sports or light up a cigarette or start gossiping after the funeral service. I mean, not two seconds after the amen is, is done. You know, I mean, I've done a lot of funerals and not two seconds after amen, the final prayer, if you're doing a graveside, people, you know, right away, the, the smokers get out there and they pull out a cigarette and, they, and others just start to talk and, you know, I said, what'd you do at Christmas? So what'd you get for Christmas? And, you know, just, mundane things. No more than a minute passes after the final prayer at a graveside service and people are in a hurry to get back to normal. It seems that people want to get the grieving over with as soon as possible. And of course, ordinary people want to blame somebody and usually they blame God or they question God concerning their tragedy. And the questions are always the same. Why now? Why this? Why me? Why then? Believers, however, are not most people. Our way of dealing with death and dying is different because of the cross that is behind us, the spirit that is within us, and the future that is before us. An example of this is Job's response to the loss of his wealth, his children, his position, all in the same day. In the book of Job, chapter one, we see the five steps that this believer went through in his experience of death and dying. And I'd like to share those with you uh, this evening. In chapter one, verse 20, go down there. Notice the first step of the believer. The first step of the believer is mourning. Not good morning, mourning, M-O-U-R, mourning. It says in chapter one, verse 20, then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell to the ground. Stop there for a second. Once Job realizes his situation, what does he do? he immediately begins to lament the loss of his children as well as the other good things that he has enjoyed for so long and now has lost. Note that he accepts as true the events that have befallen him. I mean, he tears his robe and he shaves his head and he falls to the ground. The tearing of the robe, the shaving of the head and so on and so forth were the particular ways of that culture to express that they were that they were in mourning. These were natural and cultural responses. As I say, this is the natural, healthy way to deal with tragedy. We mourn, we lament. You know, some cultures wear black for a year after the death of a loved one. We think you know, this is silly or old fashioned, but actually, it's a good way to separate oneself from a time, uh, for, for a time rather, of reconstruction emotionally and socially and spiritually. The wearing of black in those cultures says to other people, don't mind me, I'm in mourning. 
don't, don't, you know, don't worry about me if I don't seem like my old self. I'm in mourning. I remember when my dad passed away, you know, big Italian family. I mean, I wore a black tie. In those days, you know, uh, going to school, he died when I was 15, I was still in high school. Uh, and, and where I went, I went to Catholic high school, you had to wear a jacket and a tie every day, and, and I wore a black tie. My mother, remember, bought me a black tie, and that's what I wore to go to school. And it said, hey, you know, I'm in mourning. My uncles, I remember, wore black armbands, and they wore those for months after my, uh, my dad died. You know, the worst detriment to recovery from tragedy is to force a time limit for ourselves to just get over our loss. It seems that people around us are saying, come on, hurry up and get over it, will you? He's gone, she's gone, it's over. You know, I mean, can't we speed this thing up a little bit? Can't we speed up your mourning? Really? You're still mourning eight months out? You're still mourning, two years late, you're still mourning? You know, many depressions and anxieties are the result of improper time and improper effort given over to mourning the loss of a loved one. Improper time to mourning the loss of a marriage. The loss of good health. You know, in my experience and in my study, I've noticed that the worst are boys. Young boys are the worst for mourning. They're expected you know, to you know, buck up and grow up all of a sudden. All of a sudden, because somebody died, I've got to grow up five years sooner than, <laughs> than I'm supposed to. And I've read research that says that a lot of the acting out of young men are due psychologically to the lack of grieving for things that have happened in their childhood, from something as you know, simple as the loss of a pet, to the loss of a parent, to the loss of a family. In my own case, I remember the night my dad died, and I just, he died in front of me, he had a heart attack. And I was, you know, all of a sudden the emotions started to come up and I was going to cry, and you know, the natural thing to do. And at that very moment, the policeman who was there put his hand on my shoulder, I remember it like it's yesterday. We're talking, we're talking more than 50 years ago and I still remember it like it was yesterday. He put his hand on, my, on this shoulder. He came up beside me, he said, don't cry. You're a man now. You have to take care of your mother. And I didn't cry, not there, not at the funeral, not at the burial, not one time. From 15, to 30, I never cried. I never mourned him. But I acted out <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and then finally I remember when I was about 30 years old, for some reason or other, you know, you have those days, you know, you got angst, you've got the blues, you got the downers, whatever. And I couldn't understand what was wrong with me. And all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, it just blurted out. D-A-M-U, you never said goodbye. Just out of nowhere. I've been carrying that around for 15 years, this anger and resentment that you know, one hour I'd seen him and he was okay and he said, good night, all right, see, I have to go out. And then the next time I saw him, he was dead. And he never said goodbye. Well, how could he? This false idea that mourning is for babies, it's unmanly to do this type of thing. Mourning was all that Job could do at this point, and he did it as a way of saving his sanity. That's what mourning does. It saves you from going crazy with the pain and the fear and the anger. And so in the believer's response, the first response is mourning. Secondly, in the believer's response to death and dying, step number two, worship. Isn't that strange? Worship. Let's keep reading in Job chapter one, verse 20. It says, then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and he fell to the ground 
and worshiped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So as a believer, once Job could struggle to right himself from the shock, his very first thought is to go to God in worship and in prayer. Imagine that. It is unfortunate that so many see prayer as a kind of a last hope, a kind of a grasping at straws when things go bad. Instead of worship, tragedy leads many people to do what? To drink, to drugs, to excessive eating or abuse of themselves in various ways, all kinds of escapist methods to deal with the great pain associated with death and dying. Of course, the verse here in the book of Job does not contain all that he said. It doesn't repeat for us every single prayer that he uttered. Rather, we are given the conclusion of his worship and his talking to God. We read about the insight that he first gains as a result of prayer. As a result of the pain, he goes into mourning, and then he follows that with worship. And because of the worship and the prayer and the calling out to God, he gains a primary insight. And what's the primary insight? I came with nothing, I'm going to leave with nothing. That doesn't answer the question, why? It just kind of resets reality for him in this difficult moment. Initial prayer and worship does not always produce such deep insights into the nature of our situation, such clarity about its meaning. We don't arrive at insight you know, five minutes after it happened. However, when the thought of existing one more minute on this earth is too painful to bear, the only place we can and should go is to God in humble worship and prayer. And that's what he's saying here. I'm nothing, God. I'm a nothing. I came with nothing. You gave me whatever I have. I brought nothing with me. And when I leave, I will bring nothing with me. If trouble, pain, and death do not drive us to our knees, what will? You know, a lot of times I think God uses tragedy as a means to draw us nearer to Him than we ever have or could draw near to Him. We're just so busy with stuff, all of us, aren't we? Busy with important stuff, of course, raising our children and taking care of our homes and you know, work and family and, you know, and all the other stuff. We just, we're just so busy. And tragedy has a way of going, knocking all that, like clearing the table. Isn't that how it feels? You've got everything set up there and tragedy comes along as if God takes His arm and He goes wham! And He just knocks everything off the table. And He says, all right, we're going we're to try a new setup for you. See how you deal with this. Our terminal illness or the death of a loved one is beyond our understanding and power. It is a, a supernatural thing at work in our lives. It's like being strapped into a roller coaster where we feel powerless to affect anything happening to us and to our feelings. Have you, do you remember what it's like to be strapped into a roller coaster? You're laughing and you're smiling, oh, this is going to be so much fun, and yeah, now it's our turn, and the thing all of a sudden goes, and then you feel the, you know, oh. <laughs> you, you're not, you don't have a wheel, you don't have a gas pedal, you don't have a brake, right? You're just being dragged along by this machine like a rag doll. And what do you do when, you, when you're going, oh, isn't that what you do? Well, this is what you do when tragedy hits. Ah. Sometimes it's that kind of prayer. 
Seems to me that God wants to get that kind of prayer out of us sometimes. For this reason, we need to come closer to the one who does have the power to control all things, including death. This may not change the circumstances, but it does bring us peace at times and certain understanding. And so Job did this. And although his situation did not change, through his tears he was rewarded with a crystal clear understanding of the true nature of his life and its ultimate meaning and substance. And so he responded to death and dying by mourning, by prayer and worship. Step number three, so amazing. He responded with silence. Silence. In verse 22 it says, through all of this Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Although, later on, Job did break his silence, his first and correct impulse was to hold his peace and contemplate his situation and wait upon the Lord. The Bible explains this by saying that Job didn't complain to or blame God. He didn't charge God foolishly. Why did you do this? How many people in their anger and pain raise up a fist to God and say, why did you do this? And he didn't question God as to the timing or the fairness of it or the degree of suffering. Why, why am I suffering so much? How about these other people here? He didn't dwell on the why of it all with the suggestion that you know, there may have been a better way. God could have perhaps you know, fashioned another way maybe that would have been better. He did not substitute a plan of his own for what had happened that might have lessened the blow on him. He said nothing concerning the events and how they took place. The Bible says that in doing this, he sinned not. How could he have sinned? With his mouth. But he did not sin with his mouth. Kubler-Ross describe the stages of grieving as, remember, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. We've come to see these as normal human progressions and responses to death and dying. We should also note that for a weak and sinful person, these may be normal responses. However, to lash out at God in anger, and to question his actions, and to try to change his decisions or feel sorry for ourselves, all these are fleshly, worldly responses born out of our sinful and weak nature. When we cry out to God and blame Him for the situation, that's not the spirit working in us, that's the flesh. The only spiritual reaction is the final stage that Kubler-Ross describes, and that's acceptance. But compare these, however, with Job's initial response to death and dying. He mourned and lamented his loss. So we see that within his very first reaction is included most of Kubler-Ross's normal humans, human responses of denial and anger and depression. It's all, all of those things are all packaged, compressed into his mourning. And then what did he do? He drew near to God in prayer and worship. He didn't bargain with God. He bowed down before God in humility and trust. What makes us think that we can bargain with God? Whatever gave us the thought that we in any shape, in any time period, in any situation, what makes us think that we have the wherewithal to bargain with God. He didn't do that. He didn't do that. He bowed down before God in humility and he remained silent. During this time he contemplated his situation and searched for meaning. Eventually he developed a life-threatening illness. He lost the support of his wife 
and then was condemned by his friends as a sinner who had brought all of this misery upon himself. Imagine the insult. Not only did I lose my children, my health, everything. Now you're telling me it's my fault. <laughs> so these additional burdens finally led Job to uh, the last two steps in the believer's journey through the experience of grief and dying. Step number four. Step number four is enlightenment. Enlightenment. For nearly 40 chapters in an ongoing dialogue with his friends, we watch Job as he comes to grips with not simply the reality and meaning of his suffering, but the truth that stands behind not only his suffering, but the suffering of all men. Job learns that his experience is worth it if it reveals more perfectly the God that he believes in. See what I'm saying? In other words, if your suffering serves to give you a glimpse of God Almighty, then it is a small matter and only complaining, and, excuse me, and any complaining foolish and sinful in comparison to what has been discovered and what has been given to you. Enlightenment, especially the enlightenment that enables us to see God more clearly, is of more value than what we have lost, whatever that is, no matter how we suffer. You understand what I'm trying to say? The suffering is worth it if we get to know God better because of it. That's why I feel so sorry in my, in my soul, and I do, for people in this world who suffer without the knowledge of God. Their suffering, their suffering produces nothing, nothing. It's just suffering for its own sake. Job learned that life, as well as death, is in God's hands, and the painful experience of it is justified if it leads us face to face with God, even if it's for a moment. That one moment is worth all the suffering, all of it, because no one on earth can give us a glimpse of God unless He Himself reveals himself to us. Non-believers, their best hope is to arrive at that point where they accept a new reality and they learn to cope with it. You know, it is what it is. That reality being that people suffer and die and there's nothing they can do about it except carry on as best they can. This is as good as it gets for the non-believer. Your psychiatrist, your psychologist, your counselor will, will consider it successful if you, find, if you a non-believer, arrive at the point where you finally accept, okay, this is never going to change, I've got to accept it, she's gone, he's gone, my leg is gone, whatever is gone is gone and I'm just going to have to be a, a man with only one leg and I'm just going to do the best I can and, and you know, smile. And he'll say, well, good, very good, very good. You know, $50, please. You know. <laughs> but suffering and death for believers, however, brings them face to face with the ultimate reality. And that is that there is a living God who gives life and who controls death by his power. Now, a lot of people know that up here, okay? But when somebody you love dies, you get to learn that down here. And the journey from here to here is usually through suffering. The ultimate end, therefore, is that death and dying strengthens faith and hope, and it loosens its grip of fear, or rather, it loses the grip of fear and sorrow uh, on our hearts. Only an enlightened person like Paul the Apostle, for example, could write the words, when facing death, for to me to live is Christ 
and to die is gain. Are you kidding me? Only a person who knew the Lord intimately could write such a thing, facing the awful death that he was about to face. He writes that in Philippians 1 verse 21. Paul had seen beyond suffering. He had seen beyond death. He had a glimpse of God's reality and it was worth the suffering. It was worth it. Because once you see God, once you, once you experience the reality of God, there's nothing left that anybody can do to you. <laughs> you are bulletproof after that. Bulletproof. Do what you want, beat me, cut my head off, do what you want, burn my body, burn down my house. You cannot change what I know, you cannot take away what I have seen. And that brings us to step number five in Job's story. Stage number five in the believer's response to death and dying is restoration. In Job 42, verses 10 to 17, you know, the last chapters, we, we learn that God heals Job and He restores his family and his wealth and his position. Now this didn't change the fact that Job had suffered and lost children and prestige. I mean, his suffering was real. But you see, God doesn't give us our old life back. He gives us a new one. Here on earth, it's a life that we can live and it's a life we can live with. Sometimes it's very different. Sometimes it's even harder. But for believers, it's always a life where God is more prominent than He was before because He is the reward for persevering. As David, the psalmist says, you, you are the portion of my cup. He just said it in a more poetic way. God is the reward. He's the one that we receive as the reward. You may not have a parent or a child or a spouse or a loved one, or you may not have your health anymore, but you now have more of God to make up for it. And in the next world, the great promise for those who have experienced the enlightenment of suffering is that you will have all of Him all the time. Because after your death, you will leave behind everything that comes between you and Him at this present time. Your body of sin will not be there anymore. Your need to survive will not be there anymore. Your many sorrows will not be there anymore. Your earthly treasures will not be there anymore. All of these things will fall away as you are restored to the perfect relationship with God through Christ that you were originally designed to enjoy. So Kubler-Ross explained how unbelievers face death because that's all she could see, because she was an unbeliever. Job describes how a believer responds to the death and dying around and in him. He mourns the loss. He draws closer to God. He refrains from sin. And note that in doing these things, God will then lead the believer into the final stages of the experience of death and dying, and that is enlightenment, a fuller knowledge of God, and restoration, a deeper walk with God. It is within this cycle that we experience God's plan and purpose for our lives when things go terribly wrong. All of us, all of us will experience tragedy in our lives, one way or another, you just can't avoid it. And all of us will ultimately face our own demise. The only difference is that some will experience them as believers and some will face these things as non-believers. We have no control over death and dying, but we do decide how we will face these things. Will we face them as believers? or as disbelievers. As always, 
you have the opportunity to be counted as a believer this evening by confessing your faith in Jesus Christ and leaving your sinful lives behind and being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Or if you've been unfaithful as a Christian, being restored through prayer. I suppose the invitation is, if you need to prepare for your own death and dying by becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ, then I encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.